okay, uh, the upper extremity. Here we see that uh, we first begin by looking at the shoulder, and we found that the shoulder is actually comprised of three bones, the clavicle, scapula, and the humerus. So these are the three bones that you should know um, as being the things that make the shoulder functional. So first uh, of the three bones, we will begin looking at the clavicle. See the clavicle connects the upper limb to the trunk of the body and provides attachments for several muscles and ligaments. Uh, the widened sternal end of the clavicle articulates with the clavicular notch of the sternal manubrium to form the sternal clavicular joint. Uh, we commonly label this the SC joint uh, to kind of simplify uh, so you don't have to always say sternal clavicular joint. So anytime that you're referring to it, uh, you can always refer to the SC joint and that would be acceptable. Um, much the same way, we see that uh, the chromial end of the clavicle articulates with the chromial process of scapula, and this forms the chromioclavicular joint. Uh, we commonly refer to this as the AC joint, so uh, that would be applicable as well. The medial two-thirds of the body of the clavicle are convex, uh, meaning that they go outward. Uh, so if we were looking at something, this would be convex, this would be concave. So basically, the medial two-thirds, or closer to the sternum, are convex, so they curve outward. Whereas the lateral one-third is flattened and concave anteriorly. So basically, uh, the sternum does something like this, with this being anterior and this being posterior. something like this. And if you actually take your hand and feel and trace your clavicle, you can see that the clavicle does indeed curve like this. So that brings us to the scapula. The scapula is a triangle or a triangular shaped bone and it's flat that forms the posterior portion of the shoulder girdle. So it's in charge of uh, kind of being the keystone in this to hold everything together. It has a medial, lateral, and superior margin, and we see that very well uh, as a triangle, with this being the spine, this would be medial, this would be lateral, and this would be superior. Notice there's no inferior margin because of the point that is uh, originated from the joining of the medial and lateral borders. The anterior surface of the scapula uh, is called the subscapular phosphor and it's flat and concave. There's four projections of the scapula that provide attachment sites for, the, for muscles and ligaments uh, contributing to the shoulder girdle. So uh, these include the scapular spine, the chromium, the corcoid process, and the glenoid process. And so without each of these, without each of these four, uh, movement of the shoulder would not be possible. So we could look for movement and not be able to actually utilize it. The scapula continued. Uh, if we continue looking at this flat bone, we see that the glenoid process is the largest of all the projections and it forms the lateral angle of the scapula and ends in a depression called the glenoid phosphor. And so the glenoid phospha, the glenoid process is something like this. And it creates this depression. And this depression here is called the glenoid phospha, as the name implies, phospha. The shallow articular surface of the glenoid fossa joins with the relatively large articular surface of the humeral head to create the freely moving glenohumeral joint. Uh, so basically, we see that the glenohumeral joint is formed by the glenoid of the scapula and the humerus, and so that forms the glenohumeral joint. Okay, that brings us to this image. Uh, which, uh, for simplistic purposes, this is a drawing of the shoulder girdle. And uh, first we see that we have the clavicle. 
of the sternoclavicular joint here and the comeoclavicular joint there. Uh, notice on the ends of the clavicle that articulate in this joint, uh, we have the sternal end of the clavicle here and the comeo end of the clavicle here. And notice that that's just simply based on what it articulates with. Uh, the sternum and the chromium. We have the body in the center of the clavicle. And that's pretty much it for the clavicle. The clavicle is very simplistic. On the other hand, that brings us to the humerus. Here we have the glenohumeral joint. We have the head of the humerus. Then we have the bicipital groove, greater tubercle, lesser tubercle. We have the neck, and then we have the shaft of the humerus, and that's pretty much it for the humerus as well. So let's erase everything. So that we can focus on the scapula now. So if we focus on the scapula, we can see that it ha does have the triangular shape with the lateral margin being here and the medial margin being there. I notice how it all comes down into a point. That is the inferior angle. I notice that it does create a point or an angle there. We also have the superior margin here. In addition to this, we have the coracoid process, which is slightly anterior to the chromium, and posterior to the coracoid process is the chromium. And notice how it articulates with the clavicle. Additionally, we have the glenoid process here, uh, scapular notch here, which is uh, an indention, which we'll see visualized in uh, future images. And just as we have an inferior angle, we have a rounded density here, which is the superior angle. However, everything tends to look vastly different in terms of CT in comparison to what you would see normally in the diagram. We do have the manubrium here. We have sternoclavicular joint the sternal end of the clavicle, the body, the chromial end, the chromioclavicular joint of the clavicle. Additionally, we have glenohumeral joint, the head, and we don't really see any, any of the tubercles really visualized in terms of this. So let's erase everything. And that brings us to the scapula. Here we have the lateral margin, the medial margin, the inferior angle, the superior angle, scapular notch. Glenoid process, glenoid phospha, glenohumeral joint, coracoid process of the scapula, and additionally the chromium. Okay, looking at this from a, a posterior uh, portion, uh, we see that we have the scapular spine, which leads us into the chromium. Additionally, it must be said that this is a rot scapula. with the humerus residing somewhere here. 
this makes this the glenoid process with this being the glenoid phospha as we see detailed here. This is the medial border. This is the lateral border. Here we have the inferior angle. Here we have the superior angle. Here we have the scapular notch. Notice how it creates this indentation, um, which is fairly obvious, especially when you're looking at it from the posterior portion. Then anteriorly we have the four cord process. Here we see what would traditionally be called a Y view, and it kind of allows us to see what the glenoid phospha actually looks like. We see that it's just a, a depression created by the glenoid process. Uh, as we can see, this area here, and hopefully what looks like a thicker red line, is the actual glenoid process with the glenoid phospha residing in the center of it. But we do see that we're looking at it from the standpoint of this being the lateral uh, border looking towards the medial portion. Additionally, we have the core cord process jutting anteriorly and the chromium residing posteriorly. We have the scapular notch here. Uh, scapular spine would be here. So that brings us to what does it look like in terms of CT. Here we can see that we have uh, the glenohumeral joint. The glenoid phospha will be defined as this area where the arrow is pointing, and the glenoid process is this area. Additionally, we have the core cord process jutting anteriorly. We're not visualizing the chromium. If we refer to this image over here, we can see that we just scanned past the chromium and are getting into uh, the core cord process. Here we have the scapular spine. Additionally, we have the humerus with the humeral head. We're going to label that as HH residing in this area. Then we have the greater tubercle and that's pretty much all that we can actually visualize. So that brings us to the humerus. The humerus we find is a long bone that articulates with the scapula superiorly and the radius and ulna inferiorly. Uh, so it's a very long bone. It consists of a body or shaft, a lower distal end, and an upper or proximal end. Two tubercle projections uh, from the humeral head provide attachment sites for tendons and ligaments. So once again, uh, the greater and lesser tubercle are going to provide attachment sites for tendons and ligaments. The intertubular or bicipital groove separates the two tubercles. And so basically, that is what this groove actually does, is separate the two tubercles. Uh, as you can see, it's bicipital, uh, which means that it separates the two. The humerus has two necks, uh, the more proximal anatomic neck and the surgical neck. And so... Uh, we'll, we'll see as we look at our images that we're going to find two necks. Uh, one's going to be very proximal to the head, and another is going to be more distal uh, in, and labeled as a surgical neck. Here's a diagram. Here we have the head of the humerus. Here we have the greater tubercle, and here we have the lesser tubercle with the occipital groove residing here. We have the anatomic neck. Then we have the surgical neck residing in this area. Notice how the anatomical neck is more proximal to the humeral head, while uh, the surgical neck is more distal. We're looking at it from 
uh, posterior view, we see that we have the greater tubercle, the humeral head, the anatomic neck, the surgical neck, the shaft, which is this long portion here. And that brings us down to the distal portion of the humerus, uh, which will articulate with the radius and the ulna. We have a cornoid fossa and a radial fossa, which, as the name implies, radial fossa will be for the radial head, and the cornoid process or cornoid fossa we'll see will provide an articulation point uh, here as well. We also have the trochlea and the capitulum. which we'll see how it articulates with the radius and the ulna. Uh, both of these articulates, or the, both of these articulations actually occur and how it actually works. We do see that we have a jutting out here, here, and so this is an epicondyle on both sides with this being medial as the shoulder is joining the girdle this way, and this would be lateral here. Okay, looking at this image, uh, we see that we are uh, pretty much uh, just slightly lower than where we were in the previous CT image that we actually saw, uh, but it appears to be on the same patient. We have the corpoid process, scapular spine, scapular body, glenoid humeral joint, glenoid process. Here we have humeral head, and we assume this to be close to the anatomic neck. So we're going to say AN. Here we have the lesser tubercle and the greater tubercle, and we see this indentation here. This little indentation is the intertubular groove or uh, the bicipital groove. So that brings us to the labrum and the ligaments. There are three glenohumeral ligaments, uh, which we call superior, middle, and inferior, uh, which are thickenings of the fibrous capsule that surround the shoulder joint. They contribute to the formation of the glenoid labrum. So, here we have additional ligaments, such as the coracohumeral ligament, uh, coracoacromial ligament, Coracoclavicular ligament, chromioclavicular ligament, transverse humeral ligament. And so uh, basically, as you can see, coraco referring to coracoid process and humerus referring to the humerus. Uh, coraco, once again, referring to the coracoid process. Acromial, referring to the chromium. Coraco, referring to the clavicular. Or, Corcoid, the clavicular referring to the clavicle. The chromioclavicular ligament means just what it says between the chromion and the, uh, and the clavicle. Uh, the transverse ligament or transverse humeral ligament uh, then uh, will be crossing the humerus. So that brings us to the articular joint capsule. We see that it completely encloses the shoulder joint and is quite thin and loose to allow for extreme freedom of movement. That's one of the things that we have to have uh, with the shoulder uh, based on the type of joint that it is, is freedom of movement. If you don't have freedom of movement, uh, things will fall apart quickly in the shoulder. So there are two openings of the joint capsule. Uh, the first is to allow for the transition of the long head biceps brachii 
and the second is to establish communication between the joint and the subscapularis bursa. So uh, you don't really have to know both of these, but just know that there are two openings to the joint capsule of the shoulder, uh, which do, which pretty much indicates that it's not a closed capsule. So what are bursa? Bursa reduce friction where large muscles and tendons pass across the joint capsule. We, ha we see that we have two of those, uh, such as the subacromial subdeltoid bursa and the subscapularis bursa. The important thing to remember is this: it reduces friction. Friction is the enemy of the body. Uh, Any time that you have increased friction, things are going to wear out. That's why when um, your your knees have a reduction in cartilage, things tend to go wrong uh, simply because you create high stress, high tension points of the body, uh, which the body is not capable of withstanding. So the muscles that connect the upper limb to the vertebral column, we have the trapezius muscle, and pretty much what I want you to understand from these are what the functions are. The trapezius muscle functions to stabilize the scapula as well as elevate, retract, and depress the scapula. So notice it's all about the scapula for the trapezius muscle. The levitator scapula muscle functions to elevate and rotate the scapula. So it's going to elevate and rotate, once again, the scapula. The latissimus dorsi medially rotates, extends, and abducts the humerus. So the latissimus dorsi is going to be controlling the humerus in some sense and going to be in charge of rotating it, extending, and adducts. So bringing it back to the body is what the latissimus dorsi is going to be charged with. The rhomboid muscles, major and minor, function to retract the scapula and fix the scapula to the thoracic wall. So it's going to try and hold the scapula more so uh, in place to the thoracic wall. So that the scapula, when uh, things are moving, doesn't just completely uh, impinge on the movement of the shoulder. The deltoid muscle is a powerful muscle which forms the rounded contour of the shoulder and functions primarily to abduct the arm. So function is to abduct. Uh, when you think of abduct, it means to go uh, or remove, and adduct means to add. And so abduct means to take the arm away from the body, so extend the arm outside of the body. It adducts and medially rotates the arm as well. So it kind of functions with the latissimus dorsi muscle in the sense that it causes adduction as well and it is in charge of rotating the arm. The supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis muscles. They closely surround the scapula and compose the rotator cuff. When you refer to the rotator cuff, this is what you're talking about, these four muscle groups here. They are in charge of providing dynamic stability to the shoulder joint and allow for a abduction, abduction and rotation of the humerus. And so uh, it's very important for the humerus to be able to do all of these things. And that is why when you see patients who have problems with the rotator cuff, uh, typically they're not able to do any of these motions. Usually uh, abduction is the hardest, uh, and many times they don't even have the capability of raising the arm very high at all, simply because of uh, the loss of the stability from the scapula. So the muscles connecting the upper extremity to the anterior and lateral thoracic walls. We have the pectoralis major muscle, and its primary function is to adduct, medially rotate, and flex and extend the humerus, and to assist in forced inspiration. So it also assists in inspiration, so breathing is going to be helped by the pectoralis major muscle, but its primary function is to uh, work with the humerus. Uh, the pectoralis minor muscle acts to depress the scapula and assist the serratus anterior muscle in pulling the scapula forward. So the pectoralis minor muscle 
It's going to be in charge of pulling the scapula forward. So the muscles of the upper arm. We have the biceps brachii muscle, which acts as a strong flexor of the forearm. So biceps brachii is the flexor. It's named biceps because of its two expanded heads of proximal attachment, long and short. That brings us to the triceps brachii muscle. It's located on the posterior surface of the humerus and is the main extensor of the forearm. So it's going to be in charge of extending the forearm. It's named triceps because it has three expanded heads, not two. So the thing that you need to keep in mind is the biceps are going to be anterior. Triceps posterior. Uh, this will be uh, utilized very well uh, because many times it becomes very confusing where uh, things are actually located. Uh, many people get confused whether the biceps is anterior or posterior, and it's essential that we keep this in mind. The biceps is anterior, triceps is posterior, and that will become very, very essential when you're looking at CT images so that you can delineate which one you're looking at. Also notice uh, that the biceps is going to be flexing the arm and the triceps is going to be extending. So on this image we have the chromium and we have the AC joint here and the chromial end of the clavicle. Here. On this image, uh, I don't really expect you to know really anything on this image uh, as it's far too in depth for what you, you will actually be able to visualize in terms of CT. Uh, but uh, just recognize the joint capsule and uh, all of the ligaments go into making things functional for the body. Okay, so that brings us to this image. Here we can see uh, virtually the same as uh, the previous images with the glenohumeral joint here, the glenoid process, your tubular uh, groove here, or the simple groove, uh, greater tubercle, lesser tubercle, chromium, scapular spine, clavicle, and also uh, notice that there is air in the joint capsule. This is Probably from um, an arthrogram, something like that, um, where contrast is injected into this joint capsule to see uh, how it's actually performing. So, uh, not uncommon to see this as well. Also, notice that we have um, the biceps, biceps tendon. Let's erase some of this. With the biceps tendon here, and we have the deltoid. Remember, the deltoid is in charge of giving the shoulder its kind of rounded appearance, and we see that here with this muscle group, the deltoids. Additionally, we have another image where we have. Greater tubercle, lesser tubercle, bicipital groove. We're getting into the body of the scapula now. We have the clavicle here. We have air in the joint space once again. Glenoid humeral joint, glenoid process, 
Delt Woods, comprising the rounded uh, area of the shoulder. So here we have uh, another demonstration of uh, the deltoids. As you can see, it gives the shoulder this rounded sloped appearance. Uh, also notice we have the pomeoclavicular joint, clavicle, uh, sternoclavicular joint, glenohumeral joint, glenoid process, scapular body. And then we have glenoid phosphor, humeral head, anatomic neck, surgical neck, additionally on this image we have the deltoid muscle. We have the subscapularis, then we also have the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, residing just below the acromion. In relation to looking at where these muscles are, we see that we have clavicle, AC joint, scapular spine, chromium, medial margin, lateral margin, and we can see that the trapezius is the most superior, comprising a very large area. Notice how it covers a large range of thoracic vertebrae. Additionally, the deltoid muscle once again gives the shoulder a rounded appearance. Just slightly below the trapezius, we have the latissimus dorsi. Notice the location and how large this muscle is. And then, as you can see, the scapula resides below this. When we actually get into the scapula, we have a uh, ventrospinatus muscle. We have the supraspinatus muscle. The levitator scapulae. The rhomboids. So each of these serves a unique function to help maneuver the arm. But once again, things are not so clearly defined in terms of CT, so uh, it becomes much more difficult to discern where things are located. Here we have the scapular spine, the clavicle, and we have some portion of the scapula here as well. So we have the supraspinatus muscle, we have the deltoid, the infraspinatus, which is situated in this little crevice, the trapezius muscle. So once again, we have the deltoid. The deltoid should be fairly easy to discern. We have the supraspinatus. Clavicle. Coracoid process. Humeral head. 
scapular spine, trapezius muscle on posteriorly as well. And that's pretty much it for this area. Once again, we have the deltoid. Scapular spine. Subscapularis muscle. Emperospinatus muscle. Trapezius. Also, you notice the pectoralis major muscle, which at this point is lying just anterior to the clavicle. So here is the pectoralis major, pectoralis minor, deltoid, trapezius, subscapularis, Infraspinatus, teres major, and teres minor. Okay, here we have the supraspinatus phospho, where the supraspinatus muscle or rosade. Here we have the infraspinatus muscle. And as you can see the uh, infraspinatus muscle is attaching to the greater tubercle. So this is something that will become uh, essential so that you can better understand where everything is located in terms of CT. So notice we have the ribs coming in. We have uh, the humeral head, the glenoid phosphor, the glenoid process. We have occipital groove with the greater tuberosity and the lesser tuberosity. And so we have the infraspinatus muscle. Subscapularis. The deltoid, pectoralis major, and then slightly posterior to the pectoralis major, we have pectoralis minor muscle. Notice how much smaller it actually is. Here we are looking at uh, an anterior posterior view or an AP view. And we can see that we're looking at the biceps break eye muscle. As you can see we have two heads. Additionally we have the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle and as you can see 
one of the heads of the bicep brachii actually resides in that inner cubital groove or the bicepital groove. The other attaches to the full cord process here. We're not going to worry about this image. So I just draw a line through it. You won't have to worry about this one. Venturing down the arm, uh, we see that we have biceps brachii muscle, the deltoid muscle. So we're just a little removed from the actual shoulder. And then we have the triceps muscle comprising the majority of the posterior portion of the arm. Also take notice of uh, the brachial artery here and the basilic vein there. Going down even farther we have the triceps now comprising solely the posterior portion of the arm. So as you can see, the, the triceps makes up a very large portion of the biceps. As you can see, you have two heads here, or two portions of the muscle, whereas you have three for the triceps. Uh, then we also have brachialis muscle. But don't really worry about the brachialis muscle. Here we also have the brachial artery. Notice how it's kind of enlarged, and the basilic vein. Getting almost to the elbow now, we see that we have the triceps. The biceps. brachialis muscle the brachioradialis muscle and the extensor carpi radialis longus muscle so pretty much what you need to understand from this image is uh, what I actually have highlighted in purple uh, we also have the brachial artery and the basilic vein. Notice how the basilic vein and the brachial artery have kind of separated them. So, uh, using what we know, we can see uh, a little more in terms of CT. We have the deltoid muscle here. The triceps. Pectoralis major, pectoralis minor, latissimus dorsi, as we can see now we're, we're slightly uh, more distal than about mid shaft. And we can see that we have the biceps brachii muscle, the brachial vein, the basilic vein, the cephalic vein. We have the triceps making up the most inferior portion. And then it would be safe to say that this we have the brachialis muscle. comprising the majority here. Now down at the elbow we see that we have the biceps muscle, the triceps muscle, the brachial radialis muscle, and the brachialis. Additionally, we have the brachial artery, brachial vein, cephalic vein, 
the silicon. Okay, the elbow. Firstly, uh, the elbow is a hinge pivot joint, uh, which pretty much means that you can straighten and bend the elbow, but you can also rotate it to some degree. We see that the radial ulnar and radial humeral articulations create the pivot joint that aids in supination and pronation of the elbow. So without these two joints, the radial ulnar and the radial humeral, uh, there would probably be no way to articulate the elbow uh, other than possibly flexion and extension. The pronation would be impossible. So if we look at the distal humerus, we see that the distal portion of the humerus has two distinct prominences termed the medial and lateral epicondyles, uh, with associated epicondyles that provide attachment sites for the tendons and ligaments. So if we just kind of refer to a drawing, we see that this area and this area are the epicondyles. And they're charged with providing attachment sites for tendons and ligaments. The distal humerus has two cartilage covered articular surfaces uh, which are the capitulum and the trochlea for articulation with the radius and ulna. The trochlea is more medial and has the appearance of an hourglass if viewed in the horizontal plane. So we then move into the proximal radius. Uh, the radius is a long slender bone with proximal with a proximal portion that consists of the radial head, neck, and tub uh, tuberosity. So uh, the head of the radius and the neck and the tuberosity are all going to be proximal, meaning that they're going to be closer to the elbow. The radial head has a flat cartilage covered depression or fossa. The articular circumference of the radial head articulates against the radial notch of the ulna during its supination and pronation. The radial tuberosity serves as an attachment point for the biceps, brachii, and muscle. So, uh, keep that in mind, the radial tuberosity is going to have something uh, very important, and that is the attachment point for the break, uh, our biceps brachii muscle. The distal radius, uh, we find that the ulnar notch articulates with the ulna. The styloid process serves as an attachment site for the extensor plicius longus and extensor carpi radialis tendons. So, uh, many times the styloid process um, are looked at as being non-essential, but they do serve as an attachment site and prove to be very essential. Radial dorsal tubercle or Lister's tubercle is a common site for formation of bony spurs. Uh, you want to star this. I won't actually probably ask you to find what uh, or where Lister's tubercle is, but I will ask you probably uh, what is a common site for the formation of bony spurs in the wrist. And that'll be something that um, I will ask you to refer back to. So the proximal ulna. So we're once again at the elbow. Uh, the proximal ulna consists of the electronon and coronoid processes and the trochlear and radial notches. The trochlear notch allows for flexion and extension of the elbow. So uh, we'll see how this actually works when we get images. Uh, the radial notch is covered by an articular cartilage for articulation with the radial head. So as we'll see the radial head will look something like this and this notch is going to allow articulation and also allow supination so that this can kind of rotate inside of it. So the distal ulna, uh, the ulna as we get towards the wrist is going to become very small or smaller and we'll have two prominent projections. The head of the right uh, of the ulna will all, will be at the wrist, as well as the ulnar styloid process. So you're going to look for two things at the distal portion of the ulna. So the joint capsule and fat pads. 
so the entire elbow joint is surrounded. Okay, so that brings us to joint capsule and fat pads. Uh, you've probably heard of fat pads, and when there's an abnormality, usually you'll see disruption in the fat pads. We see that the entire elbow joint is surrounded by a relatively loose joint capsule. It allows for the movements and flexion and extension, but it also allows for the rotation as well. Located within the electronon and coronoid phosphorus are fat pads that fill the space between the synovial membrane and the joint capsule. So I uh, kind of think of the fat pads being a type of insulation in this sense. The fat pads help to cushion the area where the electronon and the coronoid processes move during flexion and extension of the elbow. So uh, they also act as a cushioning effect. So the ligaments, uh, the ulnar and collateral ligament, which is the medial collateral ligament, uh, consist of three components, the anterior band, posterior band, and the transverse band. Uh, the anterior band, which is the strongest, extends from the medial epicondyle of the humerus to the medial aspect of the coronary process. The posterior band originates along with the anterior band from the medial epicondyle of the humerus and inserts on the medial aspect of the electronon. The weaker transverse band stretches between the medial surfaces of the coronoid and electronon processes to unite the anterior and posterior bands. That brings us to the muscles of the forearm. And as you can guess, there are an extensive list of muscles. These muscles act to uh, extend, to flex, to even uh, move the wrist, hands, things like that. So these are very extensive and very important. So the first one that we're going to look at is the pronator teres muscle. And it works in conjunction. So it means that it works together with the pronator quadrates muscle to pronate the forearm. So as you might guess, the name pronator means that it's going to pronate the forearm. So uh, just simply know the function. The flexor carpi radialis muscle. Its actions include the flexion and radial deviation of the hand at the wrist joint. So uh, when you perform uh, sometimes maybe a radial deviation, this is the muscle that will be worked. And also flexion. The palmaris longus muscle acts to flex the hand and tighten palmar aponeurus, uh, aponeurosis. And so basically, um, flexion of the hand, once again. Okay, the flexor carpi on the aris muscle acts to flex and adduct the hand at the wrist joint. And so, flexion and adduction of the hand. The flexor digitorum superficialis muscle is the strong flexor of the middle and proximal phalanges of the second through fifth digits. So we're looking at uh, the middle and the proximal phalanges of the second through fifth digits. So this is what's going to cause a lot, a lot of your finger movements. The flexor digitorum profundus muscle provides flexion of the middle and proximal phalanges of the second through fifth digits. So it kind of shares. Um, this this load as well. So we're doing flexion, middle, and the proximal phalanges, second through fifth. Flexor pollicis longus muscle. Uh, we're not going to worry about function there. Uh, the pronator quadratus is the prime mover in pronation of the forearm. So the pronator quadratus, once again, is concerned with pronation. <clears throat> we also saw the brachial radialis, which flicks the forearm at the elbow and assists with pronation and supination. So, the brachial radialis is going to be for flexion and pronation and supination. The extensor carpi radialis longus muscle acts as an extensor and abductor of the hand at the wrist joint. 
So we see because it is an extensor, its function is going to be extension, but it also functions as an adductor of the hand. The extensor carpi radialis brevis acts to extend and abduct the hand at the wrist joint. So we see that the longest and the brevis are functioning pretty much for the same reason. Uh, the extensor digitorum muscle spreads the fingers and extends the hand. So, spreads the fingers and extends the hand. The abductor pollicius longus muscle acts to abduct and extend the thumb. So, we're getting into movements of the thumb now. So, abduct and extend the thumb. The extensor pollicius brevis muscle works together with the abductor pollicius longus to extend and abduct the thumb. So, the extensor is going to be working with the abductor. The extensor pollicius longus muscle, its main action is to extend the distal phalanx of the first digit, but can also abduct the hand. So, this muscle is going to be concerned with the extension of the distal phalanx of only the first digit. The extensor dices muscle functions with the extensor digitorum muscle to extend the index finger. So it's working for the index finger. The supinator muscle functions to supinate the forearm. As the name implies, supinator means that it is functioning for supination. So let's begin looking at some images. So looking at our images, looking at the drawing initially, we have the ulna and the radius. And so basically, we see that the radius is uh, on the thumb side, if you are in supination but uh, also we see uh, that the radius is on the lateral border and the ulna is more medial so if we begin by looking at just the radius we see that the radius has kind of a cap lock area to it and that is the head. Uh, directly below the head in this area here is the neck. And so we do see that we have a jutting out of the radius and that is the radial tuberosity. As we continue down the, the shaft of the radius we get to the end and we have a radial styloid process or styloid process of the radius right here. If we then begin looking at the ulna, we see that we have an olecranon process which is this elevated area here. Then we have a coronoid process Right here. Uh, and so, if you were to look at the electron process, you would see that it has an indentation, something like this. That is the trochlear knot, which allows articulation with the humerus. As we continue down, the ulna, we see that we reach the head of the ulna, which is this area here, with a jutting out to match the stylo process of the radius, and that is the ulnar stylo process, or the stylo process of the ulna. Now, if we were to look at it from a, a posterior view, we would see that we have the electron process being the most superior portion or the most proximal portion of the ulna 
the radial head here, radial neck. Radial tuberosity somewhat um, hidden by the ulna. We see the styloid process of the ulna, styloid process of the radius, ulna head, and also notice the radial dorsal tubercle or Lister's tubercle. It's this area right here. So if we begin by just looking at the elbow joint in itself, we'll see that we have the humerus coming in. And so we're seeing the distal humerus and the proximal radius and ulna. We see the electron process. With the coronoid process here, we see that we have the trochlea sitting inside the trochlear notch, and we have the capitulum articulating against the radial head. So the capitulum is this. So this is capitulum, this is the trochlea. We do have um, the radial tuberosity. And we also have an ulnar tuberosity, which was not seen on the previous image. Here we have an epicondyle and an epicondyle. This is the medial epicondyle here, and this is the lateral. Remember, the radius is on the lateral side, so that'll help keep everything straight. So here we see an elbow in terms of CT. Um, as you can see, this is performed with the arm fully straightened, or, or as much as the patient will allow. And we see that we have the humerus here, and this is the ulna. And so we have the electron phospho of the humerus being where the electronon process actually goes into. We have the epicondyle here and we have here. These are the lateral and medial epicondyle. And so we're seeing the ulna and the distal portion of the humerus. Here is just a little demonstration of where the fat pads are actually located. Uh, you see one fat pad here, another fat pad here, and so, and then you also see uh, subcutaneous fat here, and so uh, when you hear of trauma to the elbow area, uh, usually you're going to look for fat pad displacement, uh, because if you actually have trauma uh, to the distal portion of the humerus, it, it should displace some of the fat pads. That's one of the sure signs of trauma to an elbow region. Also notice that we have the triceps coming in. We have the brachialis muscle coming in. Also notice that we have the lecronon phospho here. We have the trochlea. We have the coronoid process and the electronome process here. Here we can see this area and this area, and that those are the fat pads. We have the anterior fat pad and the posterior fat pad. We also have uh, the brachioradialis muscle. 
cross it. Here is a demonstration of how the elbow is actually held in place. We have several ligaments. We have the ulnar ligament, kind of going over the radial head. And then we have the transverse band, the anterior band, the posterior band, uh, trying to help hold the elbow in place. And so the transverse anterior and posterior bands all are unified under an umbrella called the ulnar collateral ligament. And so uh, that's what we're focusing on here is the ulnar collateral ligament, which is the transverse anterior and posterior bands. Okay, so here we see um, the electronon process. We have what looks to be the electron phospho, medial, and lateral condyles. We have brachioradialis muscle, biceps. Or the brachialis muscle here, the biceps up here, and that is pretty much it for this image. Okay, here we have the crossing over of actually getting to simply the radius and the ulna without the humerus being involved. We have the brachial radialis muscle here. We have the ulna and the radius here. Notice how we have a curved shape, which means that this is probably the radial head. Uh, this area here is probably um, the humerus, or the last portion of the humerus, we're probably seeing uh, this being the capitulum, this little area here. We're looking at uh, the ulna, and judging by our plan up here, it looks like we're getting ready to see the core cord process or the coronoid process and continuing on down the shaft of the ulna. Uh, this image is a little hard to define uh, based on what we see. Uh, we have the brachial radialis muscle. It says radius here, and it looks like we have some degree of separation. So this is probably the radial head or the radial neck. Looking at the ulna, and this is all you really need to know from this image. Here we're actually going down mid shaft. And so you can see that this patient doesn't necessarily have their arm uh, completely supinated. It's actually kind of at an oblique angle. But, and we can tell this because of how the bones are overlaid. Uh, they should be pretty much separated. And we're seeing the ulna and the radius. And so, judging by this, the patient is probably, uh, they, they may have their hand turned in kind of an oblique, or they may actually have their hand turned in what looks to be a lateral formation.
but we can see the cephalic vein, the medial cubital vein, and the basilic or in the radial artery. Uh, but uh, you won't probably see any questions regarding this at all because it becomes uh, so tedious to actually figure out where things are. Here, on the other hand, uh, we have an image that, uh, judging by our, our planning view over here, that we're getting into the wrist. And the reason we can assume this is because this is the radius, this is the ulna, and notice how large the radius is in, in comparison to the ulna. And we know that to be true. Notice we have this little bony prominence here that's kind of sticking up. This is Lister's tubercle. We're not going to worry about the ulnar artery, cephalic vein, um, the only thing we really need to be concerned with is the radial artery which is here. We have all of these tendons uh, here and it becomes very tedious uh, to actually identify each and every one of these tendons in terms of CT. This brings us to the wrist and hand. Uh, the bony anatomy of the wrist and hand consists of the distal radius and ulna, eight carpal bones, five metacarpals, and 14 phalanges. The proximal row of the carpal bones are the scaphoid, which is sometimes called the navicular, the lunate, also called the semilunar, triquetral, also called the triquetrum, the pisiform. The distal row of them of carpal bones contains the trapezius, the trapezoid, the cavitate, and the hamate. The five metacarpals are small tubular bones with proximal and called bases, digital ends called or distal ends called heads, and a space in between called shafts or the body. So in terms of joints, uh, the distal radial ulnar articulation, such as the distal radial ulnar joint, is created when the ulnar notch of the radius moves around the articular circumference of the ulna, providing the movements of supination and pronation. The main stabilizing element of the VRUG, or J, of the distal radial ulnar joint, is an articular disc called the triangular fibrocartilage complex. The midcarpal joint is formed by the articulation between the proximal and distal carpal row. The articulation between the carpals within each row creates the intercarpal joints. The carpal metacarpal joints are formed by the articulation between the carpals and five metacarpals. The intermetacarpal articulation exists between the base of the metacarpals and is joined by the palmar and dorsal metacarpal ligaments. So the ligaments and phasia, the extrinsic ligaments reinforce the joint cavity surrounding the carpal region and include the palmar and dorsal uh, radial carpal ligaments, the radial and ulnar collateral ligaments, and the TFCC. The carpal tunnel is created by the concave arrangement of the carpal bones. A thick ligamentous band called the flexor renacum, or the transverse carpal ligament, stretches across the carpal tunnel to create an enclosure for the passage of tendons and the median nerve. So basically what I would like you to know is what the carpal tunnel is and how it is created and what the flexor uh, renacum actually does. The numerous muscles of the forearm become tendinous just before the wrist joint. Uh, the many tendons located in the wrist can be divided into palmar and dorsal tendon groups. The palmar tendon group collectively flexes the fingers and wrist. So, palmar flexes fingers and wrist. 
The muscles of the hand can be divided into three groups. The metacarpal group, which are the central muscles of the hand. The thingar group, which are muscles involving the thumb and creating the thingar eminence. And the hypothenar group, which are muscles involving the fifth digit and creating the hypothenar eminence on the ulnar side. So that brings us to images. So here we have um, kind of um, a little different view. I guess you would say we have a dividing line between um, the superior and distal or proximal and distal rows of uh, the carpal bones. We see the more proximal row contains the scaphoid, lunate, Here we see uh, pretty much uh, the distal radius and ulna, as well as uh, the carpals and um, the proximal portion of most of the hand. So we see, starting with the radius and ulna, we have the styloid process and the styloid process. We have the radius with what appears to be a fracture in it. We have the ulnar head, then we have the scaphoid, lunate, pisiform, we have uh, triquetral, hamate, capitate, trapezoid, and trapezium. And then we have carpal metacarpal joints. In between each of the carpals is the intercarpal joint. Here is the radio or the ulnar carpal joint and the radio carpal joint. Here we have the thumb, index, middle. And this would be your ring finger, and this would be your pinky. Four, one, two, three, four, five. In terms of numbering, here we can see that we have the first metacarpal, second metacarpal, third metacarpal, fourth metacarpal, fifth metacarpal. Uh, also, we have uh, also some sesamoid bones here. As we can see, uh, this is a scan through the distal row of the carpal bones. We have the hamate, and you can see the hook of the hamate here. We have the capitate, the trapezoid, and the trapezium. And notice we have the first metacarpal here is going to be articulated. Here we have the intercarpal joints, and you can argue that this would be the tunnel here even though the book doesn't label it. Notice that this is far more accurate and advanced than anything uh, you probably shot in terms of wrist views or just plain radiography. So here we're going into uh, out of the distal robe and kind of going into the proximal robe. Notice we can see a little bit of the piece going here and a little bit of the scaphoid. And that's what exactly what we see here as well. We see a little of the piece form. We're seeing some of the scaphoid. We're seeing the capitate, the 
Ham 8 and the truck we drew. Okay, here we have the radius. We have the styloid process of the radius. We have the capitate, which is very large. The hamate, which is almost as large. The pizicorn, which is slightly smaller. The lunate, the scaphoid. The scaphoid will be very easy to define because of the shape, the kind of curved shape that it has. The trapezoid, trapezium. And then we have triquetrule there as well. However, uh, because we are kind of going at this at an oblique angle, it kind of skews this, and so it makes it very hard to define really what you're looking at. So, if you were to see this on an exam, it will be very obvious. We will have, uh, I will label where your fingers are, like this would be um, number two, three, four, or five. Here would be four, probably. And so this would make this five. Um, one would be here, and I would label something to effect of distal row and then proximal so that you can easily define where you're at. So here we have um, a demonstration of uh, the rows. Uh, interestingly enough, it leaves out the piece of form. But we have the proximal row and we have the distal row. So in the proximal we have the scaphoid, the lunate, triquetrule, and the pisiform. And then in the distal we have the trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and the hamate. And so uh, notice how the proximal row has a tendency to follow this curvature of the wrist so that it fits very nicely in where the radius and the ulna uh, create this kind of arch shape. Here we have a styloid process on both the radius and the ulna with the ulna head here. Notice that we have uh, articulations between the first through the fifth digits. Here are the carpal metacarpal joints. So that brings us on up into the fingers. We're not going to worry about any of the tendons uh, because that is far beyond the scope of what we're trying to accomplish here. But we have first metacarpal, second, third, fourth, and the fifth metacarpals. That brings us to uh, the circulation. Uh, this is a venous system here. We have the cephalic vein coming down, the median cubital vein, the basilic vein, cephalic vein, Additionally, uh, here is the arterial system. Let's we're coming out of the left subclavian, and we're going down. We become the left subclavian becomes the axillary artery. Then from the axillary artery, it becomes the brachial artery, and then it continues on, and we become the radial and ulnar arteries. And then we get into the capillaries and that. 
So basically, this is why it's important to notice uh, where what is coming off your aortic arch because you would know that this is um, the nominate the nominate trunk here or the brachiocephalic trunk for the subclavian and the right common carotid. You would have the left common carotid and the subclavian. And that is it. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email at tmassingale0002 at kctcs.edu. Thanks.